Be seated. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So the gospel lesson for today is a continuation of a passage that we began last week, uh, which uh, in turn, both of these are part of a long teaching that Jesus gives in, here in the gospel of John after he has washed his disciples' feet after the teacher has washed the feet of the students, after the master has washed the feet of the followers, and after he has said, this is my commandment that you love one another. So Jesus says, abide in my love. Now, if you're going to abide with somebody, whether it be a lover or a spouse or, or a brother or sister or parent or child or friend, or if you live on your own, you have to live with yourself. And you have to abide with yourself. There's some things we have to say and do when we abide. One thing that they say that must be said uh, when we abide is, is, well, okay, five things actually. You have to say five positive things for every one negative thing. All right, they've done studies on this. Five, good morning, how are you today? Uh, I hope you have a good day. How was your day? I saw a pretty sunset today. Five positive things for every one negative thing, like please put the toilet seat down when you use it. All right, yeah. Also, in the realm of saying things, we also have to listen. They say that you can tell whether a couple will stay together within 15 minutes of their first session with you if they are willing to stop and hear each other. Honey, I got something I need to tell you. Or, Joe, uh, I, 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 I need you to listen to me for right now. And if they respond, that's a good sign. If you say, honey, I need to talk to you, and they're going, hmm, yeah, okay. Listen. Another thing about abiding, there are some things we have to do when we abide. Whoever it is we abide with, even with ourselves. Mind you, the things you say to yourself, five to one. Okay? Just saying. Things you say to yourself, five to one. And even when we are living on our own, we have to have some provision for keeping the house in a reasonably orderly and clean uh, fashion, right? Some kind of agreed upon routine. Uh, so that, you know, stuff gets done. For example, in my house, I am the one who's supposed to take care of the floors. And so we have the floors taken care of in a fashion that is agreeable to the two of us, at least, me and my wife. Also, I mow the lawn because Thine did not grow up in southern Mississippi in the summertime, and she doesn't like the heat. <laughs> Meanwhile, she will do the laundry and takes care of the bills, thanks be to God, because otherwise uh, a lot of those would be falling through the cracks. You got to get together and you figure out a budget. Set your ego at the door. Set all of the expectations and the judgments and recriminations about the fact that you don't have huge, huge, huge amounts of money aside. Because Jesus is the one who makes us valuable. And our money is a tool to show God's love to ourselves and each other. Our money is not what makes us valuable. Jesus, set that aside, and we look at how much money we got coming in, how much money we got going out, and agree on how much we're going to spend. Don't be going and spending all the money because you're depressed. It'll make you more depressed. Don't go drinking all the money either. It'll make you more depressed. Sit down, work on it. Things we say and things we do when we abide with each other. Now, if somebody is being, um, oh, I can't use that word. If somebody is being unhelpful and prideful and won't do it, okay, and uh, assumes that somebody else is going to do all the stuff in the house, you will not be abiding in love. You will be abiding in resentment, and nobody enjoys that, right?
And yet there's something even deeper to living with someone in a loving fashion. Deeper than what we say and what we do, right? They're just there. And it makes the place a home. Even our attitude towards ourselves when we live on our own, we can make our place more of a home when we assume that God is there. Jesus says, abide in my love. We will live in a crazy world. And all kinds of things are happening out there and all kinds of things are happening in here. And uh, sometimes the things that are happening in, in here make us feel like we are no good or uh, like everything's coming apart in our lives. Sometimes the things happening out there feel like, make us feel like all the chaos is coming down and there is lots to be afraid of. And we can make a choice, I guess, every once in a while. Can we abide in Jesus' love who loves us really? Can we believe that who loves us and who loves everyone in the world? Can we believe that? Can we abide in Jesus' love? Or do we have to abide in fear? Because that's the alternative. Love or fear? Abide in my love. Now here's the good news. We abide in Jesus' love sometimes, and sometimes we don't. But Jesus' love abides in us. The love of God embraces us. The love of God surrounds us. The love of God accompanies us even when we don't see it, even when we don't feel it, and especially when we don't deserve it. God is present and close. Abide in my love. Now, <clears throat> when we abide in Jesus' love, when we're doing pretty good, you know, uh, things are reasonably healthy and reasonably sane in the household, okay? Uh, things are, you know, are not yet uh, coming completely apart in our world or our community, not quite yet. Uh, we're doing all right. When we are abiding in Jesus' love, Jesus will prune us. We heard this last week. That's when God will push us beyond our comfort zones. Oh dear, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who bear fruit will be pruned so they can bear more fruit, so they can love more deeply, more fully, more expansively, so that your joy can be complete. That's what Jesus says, so that our joy can be complete. So for example, Peter, in our first lesson for today, Eric was telling us about this just now and a few minutes ago. Peter is preaching a sermon. He is speaking, and he's got himself up on a roll. Yes, indeed, he is doing pretty good, rolling along in his sermon, and suddenly the Holy Spirit interrupts him. How very rude. Yes, so the story goes like this. Um, Peter, in the book of Acts, is riding high in his witness to the love of God. Um, he has recently raised a woman from the dead. Her name is Tabitha, which means gazelle. And everyone is excited and astounded at the, at the power of God that works through Peter, who has raised gazelle from the dead. Uh, but Peter is not resting on his laurels. He is kind of pushing himself. He knows Jesus and what Jesus has told him, which is that God loves you and God loves everyone. And particularly God is concerned about folks who are poor, who have disabilities and who don't belong. So Peter is staying at someone's house. His name is Simon, Simon the Tanner. And tanners don't really belong. If you wanted to move up in the society of Jesus' day, if you wanted to be part of the in-group, part of the happening crowd, you would stay at the house of a priest or perhaps of a government official or maybe a landowner, but not a tanner. A tanner is a person who makes leather. And to make leather, you have to handle the dead bodies of dead animals. You wouldn't do that. As he washed his hands, is he going to shake, his, going to shake your hand as he washes? his hands? Yeah. Well, Peter is doing this. He's staying with Simon the Tanner. And one day he is up on the roof of Simon the Tanner's house where it's cool. You can feel a breeze up on the roof. And he sees a vision. He sees 
uh, a curtain. No, it was a sheet. They translate it as a sheet now. A sheet coming down out of heaven, and it's got inside of it, sort of wrapped up in it, all these different kinds of animals you're not supposed to eat. Okay, so like pigs and shellfish and clams and crabs and, and shrimp. No shrimp. No shrimp. Okay, can't eat that. And there's a voice that comes from heaven that says, get up, Peter, make yourself some lunch and eat. And Peter says, no, 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 it's against the rules. I've never done that. I never will. And the voice says, are you going to make unclean what God has already made clean? So then it happens three times. Curtain comes down, all these animals in it. Are you going to make unclean what God has already made clean? And Peter's wondering what this vision means. When suddenly there's a knock on the door downstairs, and uh, the Holy Spirit tells Peter, you have to go with those folks that are knocking on the door because they're coming to get you to bring you to somebody's house. So Peter says, okay. So he goes downstairs, and the people who have knocked on the door are coming in behalf of Cornelius, who is a centurion a commanding officer in the occupying Roman army. How would you feel about the commanding officer in an army that had occupied the United States for about 100 years? Hmm? Yes. Cornelius, a Gentile, way beyond Simon the Tanner, way outside of our comfort zone. But the Holy Spirit has spoken to Peter, so he goes with them, and he goes into the house of a Gentile. You're not supposed to go into the houses of Gentiles because they eat stuff like pigs and clams. Come on. And in he goes, and he's preaching about Jesus, and like we said, the Holy Spirit interrupts him like he interrupts us all the time. And Peter says, how can anyone withhold the waters of baptism from these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. The word withhold there is the exact same word as we heard last week when the Ethiopian official says, what is to prevent? What is to withhold me from baptism? What is to withhold the waters of baptism? So he baptizes all these people who are outside of the in-group, outside of the chosen people, outside of the nation of Judea. And boy, oh boy, is the church mad. Everybody's really uncomfortable. And, and, and Peter gets back to Jerusalem, and they got some real questions for it, and they have a long conversation. Mm. Jesus says in the verses after the gospel lesson for today, he says, the world will hate you for what you love. But that's okay. That's all right. Because the love of Jesus abides with us, surrounds us, fills us, even when we don't see it, don't deserve it. Where is the Holy Spirit calling us now? What is the next step that God is, is leading you to? And your family? Where is Jesus calling us as a congregation to stretch and to grow? Where is God calling us as a nation and as a species? Not because we'll be somehow unworthy if we don't do it. That's not the point. It's because the love of God has already embraced us. We are already a part of God's family. That's why. Thanks be to God.